Good lord. Hayward certainly knows how to throw a fet, doesn't he? Look at this place. Shush, shush, shush. Is someone actually alive in here? Oh, would you please be quiet? Is that... <laughs> John Fogg. Uh, it may be more accurate to say that it was John Fogg. I'm not altogether certain I have mass and form anymore. You do look rather green about the gills. And how is it your standing, Mr... Good God, Charles Chambers, what on earth are you doing here? I was invited, just like everyone else. I didn't know you knew Hayward. Everyone knows Hayward. And it seems Hayward knows everyone based on the number of people who woke up here. Or, I suppose, will be waking up here. I confess some surprise to you being among that number. You never struck me as a man who would get so caught up in revelry he would spend the night unconscious on another man's couch. I took one of the guest bedrooms, as it happens. There were a fair number open, you know. You most likely could have found one yourself instead of sleeping in an armchair. How do you know I slept here? Perhaps I've been up for hours and am simply taking in the morning at my leisure. Is that the case? No, I slept here, and was doing so quite soundly before you woke me up with your elephantine footsteps. Well, forgive me for not looking carefully enough at the floor. I've got a headache strong enough to fell a tree. <laughs> Glad I'm not the only one. I'd say the fact that we're both generally upright puts us ahead of most of the crowd, but then again, it may be preferable to still be unconscious. Is that why you didn't make it back to your own home, too sozzled? Can't imagine you stayed simply to take in the finery. I'm sure your house is as grand as this one. <laughs> Hardly. Did you not look out the windows once last night? We must have gotten several feet of snow. Getting a hansom cab would have been next to impossible. <laughs> Thought that was your specialty. The Great Chambers making the impossible possible. Well, the Great Chambers cannot make the snowy streets of Manhattan suddenly traversable. No man has that ability. Don't be so swift to assume I haven't yet made an attempt. Ah. <laughs> and that's a task Fog the Fearless is up to, is it? Anything's possible. I've never made a real go at controlling the weather, but it doesn't mean I couldn't. This is what will hold you back from being truly proficient in your illusions, Mr. Fogg. Uh, here we go again. If you continue to insist that magic is real, you'll never be fully focused on what matters. The craft. The craft. Exactly. See, this is why I was surprised to find you here. You're not a hit at parties. Well, plenty of people enjoy hearing me speak on the art of illusion. That doesn't become any less true simply because you aren't one of them. I don't appreciate being lectured on my own expertise by a lesser practitioner. A lesser practitioner? Is that what you really think of me? Well, I think you play it safe. If belief pulls my focus, then caution clouds yours. Don't misunderstand me. You're a reliable magician. My, such effusive words, Mr. Fogg. But you don't dazzle your audience, and you won't until you embrace your sense of wonder. Magic isn't about wonder. It's about precision. Of course it's about wonder. Magic without wonder is nothing at all. Magic is about wonder for the audience, but that wonder cannot be provoked without careful thought and even more careful execution. You truly are the only person I know who can make magic sound dull. And how is your show going? Out of debt yet? Excuse me? I... <clears throat> I apologize. That was untoward of me. It's the delirium tremens. Christ, man. Just say bottle ache or some such. Like a normal person. You even make drinking sound boring. Well, once again, I think there is great benefit to be found in being precise, in magic or in language. You weren't very precise with your spirits last night, though, were you? No, I was not. Help me, how is it that we've been in the same house for, oh, going on 14 hours, I'd wager, and we're only just now seeing each other? I don't know. It's a large house. You weren't avoiding me, were you? How could I have avoided you when I had no idea you were in attendance? I'm simply saying it wouldn't be the first time. I don't know what you mean. Of course you do. Last spring at Butler's grand presentation, you didn't speak to me once. 
Well, I can't imagine why I might want to steer clear of a conversation with a man who despises me. Pardon me? I'm afraid I don't have the fortitude for the usual pleasantries, not with my thumping head, so there's no need to keep up the pretense on your end. Why in the world do you suppose I despise you? You've never made any secret of your disdain for me. I find you frustrating and more than a little ridiculous. See, there you go again with the heaps of praise. But I hardly despise you. You aren't interesting enough to despise. <laughs> Good lord, Mr. Fogg, don't start pulling your punches now. I didn't intend that as a slight. I'd shudder to think what you would say if you did intend a slight. I hate... Butler. We all hate Butler. But I don't hate you. Because I'm not interesting enough. Yes, I understand. But I imagine you hate Butler for the same reason I do. In that it's hardly hate at all, but instead terribly strong professional jealousy. Well, nothing is impossible. Toppling him from his long-standing throne seems quite close. Mm. And I'm sure he'll sit on that throne for many years to come. You know, but eventually the audience will realize that he's all flash, basic sleight of hand, and capes, and top hats. How can you say that when he's done the bullet catch so many oh, times? Of course, you like the bullet catch. It's an excellent trick! And so obviously a trick. There's no true mystery to it. It's very easy to deduce how it's done. It isn't just about the mystery. God, it's, it's about the danger. There's real risk to it. Foolish, unnecessary risk. Cheap stunts don't impress me. The risk of death does not make something difficult to carry off. Dying is easy, you mean? It certainly can be. Dying because of an idiotic gun trick seems like one of the quicker ways to meet your demise in an act. So then doesn't the difficulty come in not dying? That isn't magic. That's... Gambling. Does anything at all amuse you, or did you choose your vocation purely on the basis that it allows you to talk in front of a room full of people without them talking back? That's a tad rich coming from you. You preen in the spotlight just as much as the rest of us, more so, I might say. I never said I didn't. I enjoy the stage very much, but I would have thought such an admittance of vanity would be beneath you. I... I can't deny that I enjoy being the center of attention. That, in my view, is part of the challenge. Knowing that all eyes are on you. Watching for any misstep and still performing illusions that not a single person can see the architecture of. And you think that people can see Butler's strings? I can see Butler's strings. But you are a magician. The audience are not. Well, who are we performing for most of all, if not each other? I'm not. I'll own to some professional jealousy of Butler's success, yes. But more because of the stability it provides him, not the recognition from his peers. You don't want to be recognized as a great magician? By the people, maybe. I don't much care if you or Butler or any of the others think I'm great. Hmm. Is that so hard to believe? I, I just don't comprehend why you'd want to do something when you're not aiming to be the best at it. Who says I don't want to be the best? But you just... I don't need a crowd of stuffy, old-world illusionists to call me the best to be the best. I'll know I'm the best when I see my name on the marquees of the biggest theaters in America. I'll know I'm the best when I'm front and center at the World's Fair. Ah, you have ambitions on that, do you? Don't you? I am contemplating a new act. It's three years out, and you're already planning your show? You are not? I... <laughs> I have more of an idea of the fine jacket I'll buy for the occasion than the illusions I'll perform. <laughs> you are consistent. I'll give you that. So go on. Tell me what you plan to perform at the Great Exhibition. Well, it's slightly dependent on where it ends up being. I like to tailor my acts to the audience. It will be here, certainly. No, well, I wouldn't be so confident. New York has plenty of charm, sure, but there are several cities who seem to want the honor badly. It will be in New York. But even still, you won't be building a show for a New York audience. The whole world is likely to attend. It's right there in the name. And you're counting on the whole world being dazzled by your fine coat? I have several years to decide what to do. I have no doubt that I'll come up with something brilliant and groundbreaking by then. <laughs> You've never toured, have you? I haven't had the inclination. Why? If the fair is somewhere you'll have to travel to, you may find that you want to keep things simple. Not every venue on the road is malleable. It will be in New York. 
Do you have special insights into the inner workings of the world's fair? I have an instinct. My instincts are rarely wrong. And I have an understanding of economics and resources. New York is unprepared to host an exposition of that size. Then we'll have to agree to disagree until such time that I'm proven correct. I have a better idea. I'll make you a bet. My goodness, Mr. Chambers, are you making a joke? I am not. Well, you don't strike me as a betting man. We all have our secrets, don't we? If your deepest secret is that you place a bet or two... That's not... All I mean to say is, you don't know me all that well, Mr. Fogg. It doesn't serve you to make assumptions about what kind of man I may or may not be. I've seen your act, Mr. Chambers. I think I understand you pretty well. That's all you need, is it? You look at a set of illusions and assume you know the truth behind them? You say it as if those are contradictory. Illusion and truth are the very definition of contradictory. But I am also in the business of obfuscation, as you are, and just as you can see Butler's architecture, I can read you in the illusions you perform. Is that so? In what sense? You prefer misdirection over pure sleight of hand. You're very good at it. Uh, careful. I might think you're giving me a compliment. You can take it however you like. I merely speak honestly. Despite what you might think of me, I am able to recognize skill in other magicians. You're skilled at misdirection. I'm not too bad at sleight of hand, either. No, you're not, but you don't rely on it. Based on that and the comments you've made about the art, I'd say you consider it beneath you, which I find bizarre. What do you mean? Sleight of hand is an essential element of what we do, so look down upon it. I don't look down upon it. You... You're correct. It is essential. Fundamental. It is a building block, not a building. But misdirection is. Sleight of hand is a science. Misdirection is art. It's a craft that must be constantly recalibrated for the trick, or the audience, or the venue. A magician must perfect sleight of hand to meet the basic requirements of his profession. Misdirection is what separates the proficient from the exceptional. And you consider yourself exceptional. I think I grow better with each performance. I think I could be exceptional, yes. And you don't think the same of me? I never said that. Then what is it you think of me? I think you're talented, if unpolished, and I think there's a good chance that you'll die in one of your own tricks before you're able to become great. Is that another bet you'd make? I wouldn't want to wager on that. Mm. Too improper. More that I wouldn't know who to place the bet with. If I win, you won't exactly be able to make good, will you? I suppose it's not a bet I could ever cash in on unless I stop performing magic altogether. And I have no designs on doing so. Even considering... Even considering what? Oh, even considering my debts... You mean? I wouldn't want to presume. How did you know about it? Look, I'm very sorry I said anything. I don't care about that. Really. I want to know how you know. An understanding of economics and resources, once again. I've been to your shows several times, and I know that venue well. With the frequency of your performances, the seats you're filling, and the special equipment you've built into your act, you must be running in the red. You've been to my show several times? What? Oh, yes, but... Did you not hear me? The math doesn't add up. Unless you've got some shady bookkeeping. No, you're right. I'm in massive debt. That's actually why I came to this godforsaken party in the first place. I keep hoping I'll be able to convince Hayward to invest one of these days. Any luck? He was already tanked by the time I arrived at half past ten. That sounds about right. What will you do then? I'll find a new venue. Ah, a new gullible venue? If I pick a smaller theater, I won't need to make promises I can't deliver on. I just need to get my feet back under me, and then I'll be on my way up again. I see what you mean by reading a man through his act. You live just as you perform. How do you mean? You barrel forward with no regard for planning or consequence. You convinced a theater to book you before ensuring that you'd have enough of an audience to fill the seats, and you chase after every difficult new illusion regardless of whether you're prepared to pull it off. Hence the risk you may die on stage one day. 
an end brought about by hastiness. And you are so focused on the careful minutia, on doing everything just so, because you fear that you don't have enough natural talent or charisma to hold an audience's attention. Excuse me? That was where I was going earlier. Your love for misdirection. It says just as much about you as my ambition says about me. You want to control which way the audience is looking so that they never truly see you. Any magician worth his salt wants to control the audience's attention. But you focus on it at the expense of creating true spectacle. And you hope that spectacle will be enough to cover up your sloppy mistakes. The audience isn't noticing mistakes when they're busy being odd. I perform the illusions that awe me. I try to find the true magic in it for myself, and the people come along. Is that why you think magic may be real? Because you find yourself so easily amazed by your own illusions? <laughs> you truly have no sense of whimsy, do you? Even if I see another magician pull off a trick I don't understand, I'm too busy trying to work out how they did it to bother feeling awed by it. Why is it you do what you do, then? Why be an illusionist at all if you can't find the joy in it? There's joy to be found in doing something well. I'm sure there are plenty of things you could do well. So why magic? And I suppose you entered the vocation in the hopes of one day proving your foolish belief in the unnatural. If magic is real... It is not. Then it wouldn't be unnatural at all. It would be just as much a part of our world as gravity. You're avoiding the question. So are you. Now, is that an occupational hazard, do you think? Hmm. Our need to dance around a simple truth. Our reluctance to show our hands. Perhaps. I'm not in the habit of hiding, but despite your deductions about my financial situation and your assumptions about me based on my act, you don't actually know me very well, Mr. Chambers. I'm not sure I owe you my life story. Then why should I owe you mine? You were the one that started us on this line of discussion. That I did. But you can't blame a man for asking. No, I suppose I can't. Well, Mr. Fogg, this has been... The headache worsening? Diverting. I really ought to be going back to my own home now. Get myself some coffee and eggs and whip myself back into shape. Begin the year how I intend to carry on through it. You're staying? I'm hoping to catch Hayward before I leave. Well, he's hungover and vulnerable and perhaps more inclined to open his pocketbook. <sighs> Mr. Chambers, you think so lowly of me? I think you'd be wise to strike while he's moving slow. Well, well, but don't you have a wicked streak in you? I confess, you've surprised me more in this conversation than in the past several years of acquaintance. Always keep them guessing, Mr. Fogg. First rule of magic. We never did settle on terms for a bet. About the Columbia Fair, you mean? Unless you're backing out. Hmm? I can understand if your confidence is shaken. No, no, not at all. It was your idea in the first place, so what is it you're hoping to get out of it? Hmm. <laughs> I know. I win. You perform as my apprentice in my act at the fair. <laughs> <laughs> By those are significant stakes. And you'll do the same for me when the fair takes place here in Manhattan. I will. Then you have yourself a deal. Best of luck with your new venue, Mr. Fogg. I'll see you in three years somewhere other than New York. See you in Manhattan in three years, Mr. Chambers. Happy New Year. Atypical Artist presents New Year's Day by Lauren Chippen, starring Andrew Nowak and Brigham Snow. For more information and to receive monthly missives, please visit atypicalartist.co slash New Year's Day. Thank you for listening and Happy New Year. Oh
fuck.